All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening. I'm Jeff Leach uh, with SiriusXM Marine. Also have Dan Dickerson with SiriusXM Marine. And uh, we have Sean Edmonds from uh, Team Simrad. He, uh, Sean is the training guru or expert, expert at uh, the Navico brands. Thank you for joining us, Sean. Thank you for having me. So if anybody has specific Navico or Simrad related questions, uh, feel free to chat those and Sean can answer those. And we will go through the hardware requirements and some other stuff as we get through these slides. All right, additionally, we have our joint ambassador, SiriusXM and Simrad Pro, Chris Trossett, uh, who has been a professional captain and charter captain with Real Fly Charters, his own company, uh, for quite a few years now. And uh, thank you, Chris, for joining us. Yeah, I'm excited to share what you guys got coming out here. This is great. And, game and remind us, yeah, thank you. And re remind us, you're a contender 35, is that correct? Yep, that's a 35 ST, 2021. Fantastic. And Chris literally is out there every day using this service uh, in the Keys, uh, fish mapping and weather. And um, so if you guys have any specific questions for somebody who is constantly using the service, um, we're, we have Chris here as a resource for you. All right. So if you're not familiar with SiriusXM and you're not just upgrading to fish mapping from uh, SiriusXM weather, what makes SiriusXM different and special is that this is up-to-date information that is broadcast directly on your multifunction display via satellite. So it's not cell-based, it's not internet-based, there is no app for it. This comes directly from your weather receiver, the WM4 weather receiver in this case, uh, and comes down from our satellites. Uh, it's complete coverage. So if you're looking at the blue highlighted area on the right hand part of the screen around North America, roughly that is our coverage area. And, and we're looking at roughly 150 nautical miles offshore, which is our coverage area. All right, so let's go to the Navico or the Simrad home screen here. You wanna access the data layers, whether that's weather or fish mapping directly from this chart uh, page. So we're gonna to briefly touch on weather because again, fish mapping comes with our highest tier of weather. So if you're not familiar with weather, weather includes weather radar. It includes, uh, if you go to the previous screen, Dan, please. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, it includes weather radar. It includes storm cells, wind and wave information, marine zone reports, a whole host of weather features at your disposal. Uh, specifically for you anglers, and many people know us, know SiriusXM weather well, and Chris has been using weather for years, but this is our sea surface temperature uh, information. Uh, we are happy to announce a new upgrade to uh, sea surface uh, temperatures with higher resolution. So we have a new data source, and there's no cloud cover degradation, or degradation rather. Um, so um, good stuff. Uh, and so this is part of the weather service. We're gonna get even more detailed about sea surface temperatures as we go into the fish mapping features. Yeah, just to touch on the weather. I mean, I've, I've been using that for quite a while um, before the fish mapping came out. And I mean, that is one of the best things I have on my boat. My radar can only reach out so far and it's, it's given me a lot of extra hours fishing, you know, just being able to watch the fronts come in and, and uh, you know, spend as much time fishing as possible safely. And Chris, you get, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think you get a ton of these pop-up cells that just come out of nowhere, right? Yeah, we get a lot of that in the summertime. Um, you know, a giant storm will blow up out of nowhere. You know, it'll be blue skies and then be blowing 30 and lightning everywhere. And it's really nice to be able to know which way it's moving and be able to work your way around it. Because a lot of times you'll be able to get around it and you know, move 10 miles one direction and still be fishing as opposed to just running away from it and going home. Right. And remind me, do you do split screen or do you do a dedicated screen to weather? How do you, how do you run with that? Usually I'll have uh, my chart with my overlay, the serious overlay and have the weather on that. And um, when I'm using the fish mapping, I'll just kind of flip flop back and forth, but, but have a, you know, dedicated thing to the weather. 
All right. All right, so fish mapping specifically, so that was our brief synopsis of weather. Um, fish mapping has eight dedicated layers, and we're going to take you through those layers the way that you, they appear on your SIMRAD plotter one by one. But before we get into that, I wanted to tell everybody about uh, where our data comes from. We partnered with a group called Maxar Technologies, probably best known as a publicly traded company because they are a key provider for Google Earth imagery. Uh, they have a whole suite of uh, uh, constellation of satellites and they provide Google Earth imagery for Google Earth. They also have a team of dedicated PhD oceanographers that collect and analyze raw satellite data from NASA, NOAA, and other sources. And they've been serving the commercial fishing industry internationally, as well as government entities that regulate fishing uh, around the world for over two decades. So we're, we're thrilled to be partnering with them. They're um, a very smart group and, and it's a great source of data for us. Okay, I'm gonna pick it up here and let's dive into uh, finding fish mapping. Uh, if you have the new WM4 and you've updated your software, you'll be able to subscribe to fish mapping. And then once you do, uh, it's going to show up over here when you select your weather overlay service. You'll have fish mapping as an option. Um, once you have the fish mapping set up as your overlay, then you have a fish mapping options category you can go into. And view uh, is going to be the one that has most of the features. But before we do that, I always like to tell people they should turn the legend on. Uh, it, it, you'll find it helpful, especially when you're first starting to use it, uh, to have that legend. It'll put a, a window over on the left-hand side of the screen describing things a little bit for you. So we're going to go ahead and turn the legend on. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about your data status. This is giving you the age of your data. So when you first turn your unit on, for example, um, this does update every 20 minutes. So you might have to wait as long as 19 minutes if you just missed the last go round uh, for the data to come up. But once it does, uh, it's gonna give you two pieces of information. It's gonna show you uh, the, uh, the updated time. That's the time that we got the data from the source. And then the received column is telling you how many minutes old it is in your machine, how long it's been since you got it. Um, what that is, is it's mainly a good diagnostic. If you look and you, you see that your data is, is uh, you know, 12 hours old, um, in the received column, then it means you haven't received it for the last 12 hours. So something's wrong. That, that column should never be uh, more than 20 minutes. Uh, getting back to the updated portion, uh, most of the data that we're getting from uh, Maxar is updated daily uh, with the exception of fishing recommendations. Uh, they put a lot of work into giving us fishing recommendations. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort and they release those twice a week. So fishing recommendations come out on Tuesday morning and Friday morning by 5 a.m. So you have it um, if you're headed out for the weekend um, or if you're during the week that those are the two days that uh, they provide us with the fishing recommendations. All the other information you see there pretty much updates daily. Hey, Dan, if somebody's not receiving any information in the received column, if it says zero minutes, can you tell us just about signal strength basically and how to you know, do a quick troubleshoot? Well, on the Navico uh, unit, uh, I think we should we should probably let Sean answer that one. Sure, sure. So uh, in the in the Simrad MFDs, if we hit the home button, which is the, usually the button with the little nine dots, you go to settings, the gear in the upper left hand corner, you scroll down to network, and then in the middle of the screen, you're going to have uh, a line item that says serious status. And when you hit that and open that up, that will show you your signal strength your ESN number. So if you need to set that up, that's the quickest way to find it. Cause sometimes when your installer buries it, you can't find that ESN number, but it also tells you what subscription services you have signed up for, whether it's for on the uh, weather or mapping side, as well as the audio side. So that instantly lets you know that you're communicating with it. You can see how well the signal strength is. And if you've already signed up for services, are they being sent? Is that service level being sent and supposed to be working? Great, thank you. And we will provide troubleshooting contact information at the end of this webinar too, for anybody who, who has difficulties. Okay, so diving in, uh, we, we go back to our chart screen, uh, we select our menu key, uh, we select fish mapping options, 
And first one on the list is fishing recommendations. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn all of those on. Here's what they look like. You get these uh, diamond grid color shapes that come up on screen that identify where our oceanographers have placed recommendations for specific species. So you can see how the kingfish is one color, mahi is another. Um, and uh, you can choose up to uh, all six of those if you like. You can display all six at one time. Dan, tell us a little bit about, um, or I can, uh, about fishing recommendations. These are not based on catch reports. Um, these are, so there's a recipe for each species, and that recipe includes bathymetry, plankton, sea surface temperatures, uh, eddies a whole list of things that any oceanographer looks for, for each species. And because of that recipe, uh, these recommendations are created. Um, so we ask people to put your oceanographer hat on. We're giving you a lot of data and not simply just rely on fish recommendations. Um, it, and we'll explain that in a few minutes uh, about the other features, but uh, I'll just say it right up front. Fish recommendations are great, but we have a ginormous coverage area that oceanographers have to provide uh, reports for. So if you don't see a species in your area or you don't see fish offshore when you're going to fish, do not fret, do not worry. There's other data that you, uh, we recommend you look at as opposed to just going to fish recommendations. Yeah, a lot of times with uh, the recommendations too, when, when we're in the area, it's not necessarily just, you know, billfish we're seeing in that area. Well, you know, you're, you're just gonna see a little more life there. You know, we might start catching mahi in the billfish recommendations, you know, just because all that stuff's lining up there. Doesn't necessarily mean it's just that, but, you know, there's going to be life in that area. Good point. Okay, next, weed lines. Uh, if you select the weed lines uh, category, you're going to see these uh, magenta colored spots show up on your screen if there are any weeds in the area. Um, and we're going to go in and look a little closer here. Uh, so this is, uh, the, these, are, these are weed lines. And what this is, the, uh, the way this works is uh, the satellite is making a pass and looking at the reflectivity of the water. And there's a, a software algorithm that looks at that image um, and identifies uh, potential weed spots. And then it's passed over to an oceanographer who uh, looks at it and verifies or, or uh, discounts that it may not be weeds. And they basically trace around where there's a weed line. So this is not going to be the exact shape of the weed that you see out there, but there, that's the, showing the vicinity and the approximate uh, shape is what's going on here. Uh, something to know, the, the weeds, they, um, the satellite that captures the weed image is blocked by cloud cover, uh, so that can cause an issue. Um, we also know that, you know, weeds, they, they move with the currents and the winds, so they move around a lot, uh, and they also, you know, break up and, and dissipate. Um, and for that reason, we actually put uh, three days worth of weed information into the feed, so you can select the animation button. And what that will do is that will play for you the three days of information. So here you can see it very, they show up very light uh, on the display over on the left-hand side. There's some weed images showing up there and we see the timestamp at the bottom that we're looking at an image that's two days old. And then now we're looking at an image that's one day old. They've gotten a little bit darker and you can see how they've moved. And then here we're looking at the current uh, weed image. That's how it shows up and, and you can play the loop. It'll play all three in a row also. So if, they, if it was a large group that happened to be drifting a specific direction, you can see which way they're going and, and, and you know, again, uh, put a little time and effort into it and, and calculate you know, how, wh which way they've been going and where you might go to meet them, so to speak. Uh, so that's the, uh, the weed information. Yep. Also want to make sure that people understand that what our oceanographers are looking at is that reflectivity that Dan mentioned. They're really only going to trace or put contour lines around, trace the lines around the most prominent weeds. So could you be out there and see weeds and not have them appear on your fish mapping weed line service? Absolutely. Um, but I can tell you firsthand that Dan and I and several other people have been out flying in planes and been out on the ocean in boats and verified that weed lines are where they say they are. The other thing to keep in mind is because of that satellite image, that reflectivity that comes off the ocean, 
Um, and because of the interference or disturbance, oftentimes with the bottom showing up as a reflective uh, surface in giving false information back to satellites, our oceanographers typically, in most cases, will not show weed lines for at least the first 20 miles. So you will not see weed lines within 20 miles. There are some exceptions to that. The keys are one of those exceptions, um, but just know that uh, these represent the most prominent of weed lines. All right, so any questions specifically about the last two sections that Dan just covered? A question about a WM4 software update. They didn't see where there's a software update available for WM4, and that is correct because there is none. The WM4 does not need to be updated. It's your display that needs to be updated. And we'll delve into that a little bit more towards the end of the webinar. Yep, Dan, there's a question here about since satellites are affected by cloud cover, how is it that you always have good surface temps? It's estimated to fill voids due to cloud cover? That's a question. Right, so uh, with the new satellites that we're using, we were using NOAA infrared. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have gone to uh, utilizing, in addition to the infrared satellites, we're using uh, a microwave satellite technology uh, that is able to penetrate through cloud cover and give us temperature information. So the combination of those two has uh, improved the sea surface temperature information. All right, keep the questions coming. If you do have specific questions and you need us as a resource, we will stay on at the end, but we will pause at several times during this uh, webinar. So if there's questions during the section as we're presenting it, go ahead and chat those questions. At the end of that section, much like we're doing right now, we will come back and answer those questions. All right, moving right along. All right, so going back to your main screen, we're gonna talk about sea surface temperature fronts. First, you click on the three bars, then you click on sea surface temperature fronts. So sea surface temperature fronts are the areas where there is a difference between sea temperatures or fronts, and they're rated on a scale of one to four. One is a weak front, two is a moderate front, three is a strong front, and four is a very strong front. So you see those arrows on the left-hand side of your screen, not only are these labeled one to four, they also have color gradients. So the strongest of the fronts are gonna be the darkest. And of course, if you have your legend on, you see the arrow, arrow, arrow at the very bottom that says SST front, very strong. Ideally, if you have them, you're looking for threes and fours. So you really wanna find a strong or a very strong front. And also, if you notice in the event you don't have your legend on, you notice how they put the cursor over that front line? And you see at the bottom, it actually pulls it up in our legend in the lower left-hand corner. Okay, so now we're going to talk about sea surface temperature contours. So these are actually temperature contour lines displayed on your screen. So once you click the enabled button, you'll notice that this particular screen is set for a maximum value of 76 degrees Fahrenheit and a minimum value of 58 degrees Fahrenheit. So as represented on the screen in lighter colors, the 58, and in darker color gradient of red is a 76. Well, that's a pretty wide range. Uh, and a lot of us, when we're out fishing, we like to narrow that range because we know fish species like specific range of temperatures. And so Simrad has this awesome way to narrow that range by setting your values. So in the slide bar, in this particular case, we've set the maximum value for, what was that, Dan, 74? And the minimum value of 70. Now look at the contrast. So you can see a pretty substantial break there where that 70 and 74 are right next to each other. Uh, and you see very, a very narrow window of temperatures. Again, the lowest of the temperatures are a light colored red. The highest of the temperatures are a dark colored red lines. So useful to dial in your temps. Sometimes you'll see, you know, in summer, and I'm sure Chris can attest to this, but a, a big wash of colors, not, not a whole lot of difference. There's a very little temperature delineation or break out there 
because the sea surface temperatures are pretty much all the same. So you're looking for the slightest of breaks. Uh, you can tell us, Chris, but what a one degree, maybe a two degree break, is that worthwhile? Yeah, a lot of time in the summer in the Keys, you know, it's only a few degrees different. So I'll, I'll have my, my values pretty close together, you know, three, four degrees at the most, and it'll really narrow everything down and you can, you'll end up seeing exactly where the edge of the Gulf Stream is, even though it's only a degree or two difference. So it, it works to just play with it a lot and, you know, just look at it as you're fishing and you'll kind of get the idea of it. All right, so now we're gonna talk about plankton fronts. So not, uh, so pretty similar to sea surface temperature fronts, there is a scale here, but the scale doesn't start at one, it starts at two, just because number one plankton fronts are, are not very valuable to anybody. So again, you're looking at density of plankton next to less dense areas. So these fronts where there's a delineation between very strong, rich amounts of plankton and no plankton at all. Plankton, you know, often used, uh, people often use the word chlorophyll. Um, and in, in many cases, plankton, uh, if it has chlorophyll uh, in it, that's what gives it visibility. And you can see dense, rich areas that are turbid, darker maybe, uh, where uh, that are up in often cases that are up against much clearer water. Uh, and I'm sure everybody on this call has been offshore where you're seeing a very clear break in the water. Uh, and oftentimes that could be a, a substantial plankton front next to one that's nothing. So again, scale of two to four, two being a moderate front, a three being a strong front, and a four being a very strong front. So ideally, much like sea surface temperature fronts, you're looking for the threes and the fours. Uh, and that is important. Okay, uh, plankton contours is some more data that we're providing. So this is um, plankton in milligrams per cubic meter. Uh, and the lighter lines um, are less dense areas of plankton and the darker lines are more dense areas of plankton. Um, and you can see that represented on the, the scale on the left-hand side. Again, that's milligrams per cubic meters. All right, I think there were a few questions there. Okay, on the number four plankton front, it showed up as a circle. Uh, they're asking, is the whole circle filled with plankton? Yeah, good question. So really the circle represents, the really is what you're looking for is the line. So the line is the delineation between plankton and no plankton. Um, I have to inquire with our oceanographers if the entire circle is filled with plankton but you're really looking for those lines. And in an ideal situation, and, and what a lot of anglers out there have already reported back to us is you're, you're zigzagging back and forth across that line, whether it's a sea surface temperature front or whether it's a plankton front, don't just run the line, kind of zigzag back and forth. Okay, another Any other question? question? Is, is, is the temp front just the hard temp breaks? Not sure I understand that one. Is the temp front just the hard temp breaks? So that, yes. So, so yes, it's on a grading scale. So you're looking for the most substantial temp breaks. So the area where there is a drastic transition in temperature. So the answer to that question is yes. And of course, you're looking for those threes and the fours as mentioned, because the threes are the very strong and the, and the fours are uh, the threes of the strong and the fours are the very strong. Jeff, could you better uh, describe the difference between a plankton contour and a plankton front? Yep, so uh, contours are really uh, measuring the density of plankton in an area. Um, personally find it much more useful to look at fronts because you're looking where that dense rich water abuts or is adjacent to much less dense water and that tends to be where bait fish stack up and you find predatory activity with pelagics feeding on the bait fish that are eating off the plankton. Right. Basically the, the plankton concentration is just the, uh, is just that it's just the concentration data uh, that's been determined. Whereas a plankton front is where the oceanographer has gone in and looked at it and also applied other uh, factors like uh, 
currents and wind conditions to show where the buildup and where you are more likely to see a change in the turbidity of the water. So we're, we, we're finding the plankton fronts are, are the better of the two resources to use. All right, keep the questions coming. Um, we'll go through another section of features and uh, yeah, keep them coming and we'll stop afterwards again. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about sea surface height anomaly. Uh, this is one of, one of my uh, favorite items to use when they're available. They're not, it's not always, they're not always usable. So we're gonna talk about that. And basically with sea surface height anomaly, uh, you have to enable them. And there are min max values that you can set, but, but to be honest, the, the, uh, the factory defaults are just fine unless you really get into the specifics. Um, so we just uh, need to turn it on to enable it. And then you're gonna get these uh, orange, brownish orange color lines that show up on screen and there will be numbers along those lines and there will be either negative numbers or positive numbers. And a negative number denotes an upwelling. This is where the average surface height, the average height of the ocean is at a low point because it changes everywhere. Um, and using uh, satellite technology, we're able to de detect where the ocean is above its average height and below its average height. When it goes down, it go reaches a certain point and then it's going to start rising back up again. When it does that, it brings cooler bottom water and nutrients up with it, and the bait fish tend to follow that chain. So when you see a negative number, that means it's reached a low point and it's starting to rise back up again. So it's a little counterintuitive. Negative numbers are good. You want to be where the negative numbers are. The other interesting thing about upwellings is they produce a counterclockwise current. And I'll touch on that more in a minute. So those are upwellings. Look for the negative numbers. We have, we see that we have a negative five here and a negative 10. And on SIMRAD devices, that information is in centimeters. So it, it's not a big difference, but it is, it is a difference that has been detected. Now, next we talk about downwelling. A downwelling is where the average height is higher than normal and it's reached a peak and it started falling. And when it does that, it's, it's like flushing a toilet. It takes everything with it. It washes away the, the nutrients and consequently there's no bait congregating in that area. You know, we've, we've all been out there uh, fishing on our favorite spots on one day and done very well on, on another day, not done so good at all, not had an, a, an, even a bite. And the reason could be is the day you caught fish, you were on an upwelling. The day you didn't, it happened to be a downwelling at that location. So again, the positive numbers show downwellings and downwellings produce a clockwise current. So when you put these two together, you get what we call a convergence zone. And that convergence zone in the middle produces somewhat of a, of what we call a, a vertical current shaft. And that's where the bait fish really like to congregate. If you can get on a convergence zone, and it has to be where an upwelling and downwelling are close together. So you, you can't just see one of these circles with a negative number way out in the middle of nowhere and say, oh, there's uh, an upwelling, I should go there. Not necessarily. I mean, if there's nothing else to choose from, then I'd say yes. But if you can find an area where an upwelling is close to a downwelling, and the way we show it is these lines run close together, when you see these orange brown lines come close together and get to the zero point, that's the actual surface average right there. So that's where it's changing. It's high on one side and low on the other. That's gonna be your convergence zone and that's gonna be the place you're gonna find bait activity. The other thing I'll say is um, some people reference eddies and, and Chris, I don't know how influential they are in your fishing decision or how often you see those, but sometimes you see these pockets of water. And as Dan described with the upwelling and downwelling with those currents that are um, either clockwise or counterclockwise, um, some people look for those uh, in fishing. Is that uh, of interest to you, Chris, or not? Yeah, a lot of times we will get a, a big uh, upwelling 
that spins around when the Gulf Stream comes out. Oh. It'll push way out from Key West, and then everything kind of spins in, and that's when we'll start to, you know, move in closer to the reef because all that water is coming inshore. So and are you fishing to the on the inside of that eddy or on the side of that eddy? Yeah, it's it's kind of where that starts to meet the reef, the okay. reef line down here, and then it's pushing everything right into us. Um, you know, we we had always known that that's where we want to fish and then seeing this stuff, it just kind of paints a picture for us, confirms everything that we've been doing for the last 15 <laughs> years. So pretty cool to see. Okay, next we're gonna talk about 30 meter sub temperatures. So this is like sea surface temperature, you have to enable it and you can set minimum and maximum values. But this is not the surface temperature, this is subsurface. It's done using a software algorithm um, and they've been doing it for many, many years and they figured out they've been, it's very accurate. So basically what you're seeing is the temperature at 100 feet below the surface. So there are no contour lines close to shore where it's less than 100 feet deep. You, you're, you're gonna see they, these start to show up if you have it enabled at, where depths go greater than 100 feet. Um, and looking at it just like this, it doesn't look very interesting. Uh, this was taken not that long ago, and you can see where the, the Gulf Stream, basically this is the Gulf Stream showing up uh, off the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. But to put things in, in better perspective, uh, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the surface temperature and the subsurface temperature. So you can see over, sorry, you can see <laughs> over on the left-hand side, where the surface temperature is about 58, 60 degrees. And I have the cursor at the exact same location on both screenshots, the, the lat lawns are identical. So we can see it's 58 degrees on the surface and here it's 68 degrees subsurface. So 10 degrees warmer, 100 feet down in, in this instance. And I think in Florida, uh, Chris, this is where you guys are, are really liking this information yeah this this definitely simplifies everything like we were talking about earlier where you know in the summertime everything's only a few degrees difference if you see down a little bit further it, it makes a pretty distinct line on you know where the gulf stream's at and where the edge of it is just because everything on the surface is really hot that time of year so this this definitely makes makes it a lot easier in the warmer months for us Okay, so next we're gonna talk about combining layers. So here, what we've done is we've turned on both the plankton fronts and the sea surface temperature fronts. And these are without a doubt the two that are probably the most useful out of all of these new features. Uh, we, we all have been using temperature breaks for years. And we've mentioned that temperature fronts basically are isolating where the strongest breaks are occurring. And then we are able to put the plankton information on top of that. So for example, right here, we see a number three plankton front and a number three temperature front running parallel to one another. When I see a red and green line like that, that's like Christmas. There's gonna be bait activity along there without a doubt if you can get the two of those in the same proximity, either running parallel, very close together, or intersecting one another. And just to, to, to drive this point home a bit farther, here's a perfect example. We've got a strong temperature front and a strong plankton front, and you can see how the fishing recommendations are stacking up right along that front. So going back to fishing recommendations, the oceanographers are very cautious about putting out a fishing recommendation. They have a very strict set, set of parameters. If, 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 they're look, if they're gonna put a recommendation out for uh, a billfish and it, it's off, the temperature is off by one degree, they won't put the recommendation out. But the temp fronts and the plankton fronts will still be there. So uh, you, you wanna look for those temp fronts and those plankton fronts. And, and if there's fishing recommendations, so much the better. Uh, but the, that's the, uh, the point that we like to drive home about this, this plankton information and this temperature information. And again, and in, in using all the, everything all combined, you know, especially the fishing recommendations, 
you know, don't be afraid to, to look at, you know, a different recommendation and spend some time in the area. And, you know, cause as you can see, everything lines up with all these contours. And even though the temp's off a little bit, sometimes, you know, you might find that bill fish in, in the tuna rec <clears throat> recommendation or, you know, find mahi in there as well. It, it's, it's definitely where everything's going to be that particular day. Dan, can you also walk us through the decluttering of the screen? The screen that we just showed with the combo, uh, it looks so clean and crisp and clear, but often that's not the case uh, because you've got bathymetry overlaid and oftentimes, and, and um, tell us about that if you would. Right, for the purposes of the webinar, um, I typically set the chart resolution to low. Uh, so in, on, your, on your charting part, as part of your navigation screen, you can identify which features you want to see on your charts. And it's, there's, there's, there's two ways. Uh, there's just a, you can go into chart detail and set it for low, medium or, or high. And then uh, you can also, when it's on high, you can select specific items that you want to see or don't want to see and have them overlaid. So for instance, uh, the, the streets on land or the, the names on land could be there or not there or, or uh, fishing aids or obstructions. Uh, on this example, you can see some little fish symbols that I left on the screen. You know, a, a lot of those pieces of information are optional. So you can choose and it takes a little while to fine tune it to get it the way uh, it's gonna work best for you. And in particular, bathymetry, sometimes when you overlay bathymetry, just, there's just an awful lot going on and it's really kind of hard to see these contours and recommendations. So. Uh, if you need any assistance, we will give our contact information and Sean's contact information and support contact information for anybody who needs help kind of pulling those two pieces apart uh, if needed so you can see the screen more clear. clearly. Sean, did you have any, I know there's a lot of new charts, you know, out there that Simrad works with. Do you have any, any additional information you want to pass on? Are there any charts that, that fish mapping doesn't work with that we need to be aware of? Um, no, no. The only thing is there are going to be certain charts that uh, you have to go in and turn on shaded relief to enable. So if you do want to see your Seymour mapping, your uh, Florida marine tracks, that's the only thing you have to do is just make sure you turn that on. But like you were saying, you could go into your user data and then select or deselect what you want to view or don't want to view to clean up that screen. Thanks. All right, I don't see any specific questions that we haven't already covered. Um, and hopefully we made it clear about the temperature fronts, the highest numbers with the largest difference in temperature is temperature fronts, you're looking for threes and fours, strong and very, very strong. All right, we will pause for questions again. So keep the questions coming. Sean, you wanna jump in on this? I will take that since we've seen all of these wonderful features. We'll talk a little bit about the hardware. Uh, it is the WM4. Uh, the part number is 000-14970-001. Uh, just for the recording, but talk to any of your uh, electronics dealers or wholesalers and they can get that to you. Uh, we did have some questions earlier and I do want to address that. The WM4 is the only module to add the fish mapping features. If you have a WM3, you can use the weather and the audio service. But if you want fish mapping, you must have a WM4. You'll still get the weather and the audio, but it also adds that fish mapping layer. Uh, so that has to happen in order to get all of these great features that uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, with fish mapping. Sean, uh, which, which model does the WM4 represent? Okay, uh, that'll be, I'll have another slide just coming up. We'll kind of okay. show that, but it's really just think about it. It's the Evo, it's the Evo 3s. So whether it's NSS or NSO, it's got to say Evo 3 or Evo 3S. So Evo 2s are not, uh, Go Series does not. I know some people have Go Series with WM4, uh, WM3s right now, and um they're probably a little bummed that they cannot get a WM4 on that. And that's just because how much processing power we need to bring this in. The WM3 had some caching memory. The WM4, we're using our processor to make sure we're getting this data and presenting it properly. So uh, that's, those are the units that will use it. Now, 
There are some great uh, rebates and incentives that are happening on this unit as well. So it is 449 for the unit list price, but we do have uh, the uh, serious rebate. So there's a hundred dollar rebate. So you'll get that in a gift card, a Visa gift card. And basically the requirements are you need to purchase the unit prior to December 31st of this year. We need to have a 60 day paid subscription. So after that 60 days, uh, that will be coming back to you in that gift card. And then we just had need to complete the online form. And we can access that through the SiriusXM website at SiriusXM.com slash marine rebate. Or you can simply go to Simrad-Yachting.com, look at offers, and we'll walk you through the entire process as well. Now, another nice uh, incentive is for new subscribers, uh, where their Sirius is also offering up a month free. So basically you call that 1-844-342-0665 and they'll know that you're a new subscriber and you will get that for free as well. So uh, some great incentives to try and help drive uh, some of our customers into this fish mapping. And it's a, such a huge benefit as we've been talking about. Uh, so also to get that $100 back uh, makes it really uh, a nice incentive. We'll do one more, we'll talk about uh, software. So how do we use the fish mapping feature? In the MFD, you must have 20.2. So the easiest way to find out what software you have is if you hit the home button, the nine dots, you go to the settings menu, which is the gear in the left upper left-hand corner. And then on that main page, you uh, scroll down to the bottom and you hit about. When you hit about in the upper, right, upper left-hand corner, you will see the software version. So that'll tell you. And if you do not have it, if you go to simrad-yachting.com and you see right there on that homepage in that upper left picture, you hit help and support. We move over to the right, you're gonna see a new screen pop up and you're gonna see manual and so, uh, software updates. So once we click that, the lower left, you're gonna see downloads and now you just click your series. So you look down that list and you're gonna select, there we go. So. NSO or NSS in the EVO 3, the EVO 2, again, just remember that is not able to use the WM4. But once you click that, you scroll down to the bottom, it says software, you download it, put it on a micro SD card, install it into your machine. And then you'll notice when you go and open up uh, under that chart and you hit uh, menu and overlays, you'll now see fish mapping as an option outside of weather. So you'll have both of those there for you uh, and then just call up again with that ESN number. So for your subscription, they're going to want that ESN number. They don't want to know which module. So like we talked about earlier, if you don't know or if you've installed it, you've thrown the box away because there's usually a sticker on it. You can always go into the unit and hit the home button, the nine dots, go to settings, the gear in the upper left hand corner, scroll down to network, and then in the center of the page, hit serious status. And that will give you your ESN number. And it also has the 800 number there to uh, call series for that subscription. Good uh, segue there. Let's go back to the hardware slide real quick. I did want to point out to everybody on the call that uh, save yourself some frustration and don't just go to SiriusXM.com forward, go to SiriusXM.com forward slash Marine um, or call this dedicated 1-800 number. Um, we do have a call center that is dedicated for aviation and Marine. They're used to taking uh, aviation and marine calls. If you call the general SiriusXM.com uh, call number, you may be routed to some international call center that has no idea we even have a marine and aviation uh, uh, division. So that's important. The other thing here is that we just added a, a one month trial in addition to fish mapping uh, radio, SiriusXM radio, uh, which you can receive signal through and we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, via your uh, WM4. So take advantage of that if you want to listen to Sirius XM radio aboard your boat as well. Yep. And we also had one other question about, can you don't download software directly to the machine through Wi-Fi? Yes, you can. Uh, that is always an option to do that if you're connected to a hotspot and that's the home button, go to settings. You go down to uh, about and hit check system for updates. And if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, it'll automatically tell you that the 20.2 is available. But we need a micro SD card in the machine to download the software to it. So we, we try to send that to a micro SD card 
So in the event we lose Wi-Fi or anything like that, we're not directly uploading the machine. Okay, there was a very observant question uh, about the fish recommendations. Somebody noticed that there was blue marlin on the list of recommendations and blue marlin has been removed because that's a subcategory uh, in, the, in the main category header is billfish. Uh, and the same applies for tuna. So uh, there's numerous species of tuna. They all fall up in the, under the heading of tuna. So if there's one specific species of tuna in your particular area, that would fall under the tuna heading. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, there were some questions about pricing and about offshore weather. So the, the cost for fish mapping is $99.99 a month. This is our superset. And again, it includes offshore weather. So our highest tier of weather is already $59.99. So it's $60 a month. So for an additional $40, we're giving you those eight dedicated fish mapping features. Uh, it's a fixed cost. The cost does not change depending on how much data you use. Uh, so satellite-based fixed cost, $99.99 a month. Uh, and if you're not using it, I noticed some people on this call are from the Northern latitudes, or I'm sure there's people on this car, call whose boat are up on the hard for a while doing some work or repairs or bottom pain or whatever. If you're not using your boat, there's no sense in paying for the service. So as opposed to deactivating, which is a bit of a process, we recommend people seasonally suspend. Seasonally suspending is simply calling into the 1-800 number for the Marine and Aviation Division and then asking them to suspend your service. You can suspend for up to six months. And more or less what it does, it is it just puts your account in an escrow holding. There's no charge to suspend. And you tell the call agent exactly when you want your system refreshed or woken up. So on that date, it'll send a signal to your system and it'll wake it back up once it receives that signal. There's no reactivation fee. If you deactivate, you're gonna have to reactivate, which means another call into a call center, an activation fee and, and a bit of a, you know, more of a process. So seasonal suspend really is the way to go if you're not using your service for, for a period of time up to six months. All right, we would be remiss if we did not mention what got us all to the game in the first place and our big brother, and that is Sirius XM Radio. Uh, there is a whole lot of content out there. I suspect that a decent amount of you are already SiriusXM subscribers, and thank you for that. Um, but why not add SiriusXM to your boat? Um, if you uh, pair the two together and put them under the same subscription, you get roughly a 30% savings on the radio um, on your boat. All right, last but not least, we um, have partnered with a company that we're, we really wanna support. It's called the uh, Dolphin Fish Research Program, otherwise known as DRP. DRP is providing critical research for dolphin fish. And most of us who are anglers and going offshore, we don't really even think about how much mahi we take on a regular basis. You pull up to a weed line and as many mahi as you can hook up and put in the boat, you, you, you're thrilled, right? Well, this company is doing migratory data uh, t talking about migratory patterns, charting migratory patterns, and they're doing it by people like yourselves tagging mahi. The process of tagging a mahi takes a minute when you're good at it, uh, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. There's videos on it. So we're encouraging everybody on this call who is offshore fishing for mahi to request a tagging kit, uh, and they're free. Uh, it's dogging, dolphintagging.com forward slash tags. They'll send you a free tagging kit. They'll give you instructions. They'll let you know how to uh, you know, put the tag and how to record it. Uh, again, it's fairly simple and it's really worthwhile. Uh, and we're thrilled to be supporting this valuable uh, organization. So please, uh, please sign up. <clears throat> All right, some resources for you. I did mention at the beginning of this call, we are recording this webinar. We will send it back out to you along with our how-to videos that Dan and I've created but there's other valuable resources and SiriusXM.com forward slash fish mapping, our fish mapping website does have a lot of the detail and content you need. We do have a video dedicated video library by brand. So when you go to the video library, click on your brand and that's SiriusXM.com forward slash marine library that houses uh, and archives all of our videos. And then if you're just looking for general videos, uh, YouTube channel as well has videos on it, youtube.com forward slash SXM marine. 
And if you haven't already, we encourage everybody to follow us on social media. Uh, we love hearing from you. We love following you. We love seeing your tags and your pictures and uh, appreciate um, your connection. All right, we will uh, um, have more questions. If you guys have some, um, we wanted to give you some support information. So if you have technical questions about SiriusXM, about your service, about your coverage, um, anything you need, uh, we recommend that you email us. And this Marine support uh, email goes directly to Dan, who is really the foremost expert in the world on SiriusXM Marine Services. Dan deals with technical calls and our customers on a daily basis. So marine.support at SiriusXM.com. Jot that down if you need it in the future. Marine.support at SiriusXM.com. And then on the Simrad side, Sean, just simrad-yachtynet.com forward slash contact us. Is there any other tech support uh, email or contact information that you would recommend, uh, Sean? Um, as far as on the water, just give our product support division a call at 1-800-628-4487. Uh, and that way, if you're on the boat, they can help you walk you through push buttons with you. It's always good uh, to do it right directly on the boat. So uh, they have those products in front of them and they can walk through step-by-step step with you. Super. So for anybody who wants to stick around and ask questions, we will continue to answer questions as long as they keep coming, we will stick around. Otherwise, thank you very much for everybody joining us this evening.